this is all part of the grief dance. And I, I just want to explain for a moment about the use of dance, because it's about dancing, I think, is about partnership and how you're going to partner with whoever or, or even the music. And, and sometimes that partnership feels really smooth and easy. And sometimes it's staccato and sometimes it's jagged and, but not being afraid to be in that partnership is part of what makes the grief process and your evolution in your own healing possible. Hello and welcome to Grief, Gratitude and the Grey in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Today's guest is Edie Nathan. She is the best-selling author of It's Grief. Uh, where she examines the emotional and devastating impact of loss and trauma. And grief is really hard to talk about. And of course, on this podcast, we talk a lot about it. Uh, so we'll be talking with Edie about it. She uh, teaches us how to dance with our grief and to know that it as a way to know ourselves. Um, so she is also a psychotherapist and uh we will be learning more about all the other things that you do. The intros are always like my hardest part, Edie, of like, oh my goodness, all the, what do I say? What do I say? So I make sure that I encompass, and I could read it verbatim, verbatim, but I like it to also just be, uh, you know, just real. So thank you so much for being here, Edie. Oh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, I was contacted to be able to have you on the podcast and dive deeper into this topic of grief and talk about your book. But let's start talking about you. We were just before uh, recording, we're talking about where you're at. So let's talk about that. Where do you live right now? You know, these times of COVID have um, made some of us gypsies. And so I'm <laughs> feeling a little bit like a gypsy right okay. now. Um, I feel I, I sold all of my earthly belongings and moved part-time to Lee, Massachusetts, which is in the Berkshires, and part-time in Astoria, Queens. And I've got the dimensions of two very, the opposite. Contrasting. I was just going right? to say. The contrast is massive. Oh, that is so contrasting. The busyness right? of a city and then the relaxing you know, part That's of that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, how and, often and, do you go to Astor Astoria? So Astoria probably once a month for a week and then the rest of the time here in Lee and just adjusting to um, really, you know, you and I were talking about like having two different languages that you go between. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going between two different environments. I sometimes don't know what side of the bed I'm on and depending <laughs> on what house I'm in, I get to, oh, oh that's where I am. You know, that, that's what's going on. I like even searching for like your, your coffee maker in the morning or anything, right? Like you're like yes. your brain, you realize how programmed sometimes we are when we do those things. And then you kind of switch it all of a sudden and your brain has to kind of wait a minute you got to do some work here don't just go with emotions <laughs> that's right and actually that's that's a, a wonderful lead-in to to really what we're going to be talking about today which is grief because that's exactly what happens when when we step into that grief response oh, okay. everything is haywire the things that we knew we don't know anymore or they're just not available to us the coping mechanisms that used to work aren't working as well or need to change. Mm -hmm. Our language may be scattered where maybe we're, you know, we're, we're not able to find our words or, or I know that in the, my deepest, deepest sense of loss, 
which was uh, when when I lost my first love at 27, mm-hmm. that um, I, w- we were living in New York and I left the house with two different shoes on. Wow. And when I say that they were two different shoes, I'm not talking about two flats or two different sneakers, a high heel and a flat. Mm. And I didn't even recognize it. And that's just not me. Like that's not, would not be a description of how people like see me or how I even see myself that I would be that scattered. Like I'm rather a perfectionist with how I want to present, Mm -hmm. which is also a grief story. So understand that when I'm talking about grief, I'm talking about grief, the big G's and the little G's. Mm -hmm. And the big G's are the loss of loved ones the loss of a limb, long-term illness, the little G's are, and it's going to sound funny. The secondary losses. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry sorry to interrupt you there. (laughs) No, no, interrupt. I I need to be interrupted. So it's perfect. (laughs) No, no, no. You were saying little G's. Okay. So bad haircut, Uh, even a a small boot, like you, like even grieving every time you switch to even just that house, in our story, a back and forth, even that would be a little G. So the secondary losses could be even in the big G's or in the little G's, there could be secondary losses within these big griefs or little griefs. Absolutely. So, so, um, so to actually bring that home is really, it's, it's, I'm so glad that you brought up the secondary grief because secondary doesn't mean it's any less important. Yes. Right. So someone loses their husband they were in the process of moving into a new house that they just built and Mm -hmm. um and they 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 don't know if they should move in or not move in sell the house before they move in because it's not a house that one they're going to be able to afford on their own or two that they would want to live in without their love and in a way it's part of the primary grief it is also a secondary grief because money is now being held in escrow as an example. And while all of this is going on, um, you know, the daughter needs psychological help or the son needs, you know, to get to basketball and baseball because that is the son's coping mechanisms. And you cannot find a way to navigate through that, you know, as that whole person, because you've got the primary grief, you've got the secondary grief, and then you've got all of the, the things that you never thought you would be dealing with. Absolutely. And then you're also then, you mentioned even the children, then you're also adding to that, if you have children or if any other loved one, you're adding to that the grief of those around you that you're also having to kind of, you know, drive or, you know, like you said, drive around here, drive around there and, and deal with yours as well and add to your bucket. And that's why sometimes you end up walking out of the house with a high heel and a flat that's, that's uh, exactly because right. it's just so much that's going on. It's very um, disorienting. It's a, it, it's a disorienting experience. It's a fog. They call it grief fog, right? Sometimes. Yep. So it's a, uh, it's understandable when as a psychotherapist, when people have gone to you in their grief journey, is there a timeline that you've noticed that it's like, more common, like after a certain amount of months that people suddenly show up to see you. Uh, And in those times, do you notice they talk about more of these secondary losses sometimes than even the aspect of missing the person? Curious. So you've got two really different questions. (laughs) Let's you take whichever one you want, Edie. You take whichever one you want. I love them both because there are no assumptions in this work. And when someone comes in, it could be a month. It could be a year. In the case of 9-11, it could be five years. It could be 10 years Mm -hmm. because grief works in funny ways. And the undercurrent of grief comes in, possesses you, or you have found some way to put it in a box and then one day the box cannot be shut any longer. There's a trigger, there's a smell in the air, there's something that happens that you just, you're not holding on to it the way that you used to, Mm -hmm. okay? So 
yes, some people might talk about secondary grief first, and they may not even think of it as grief. Mm -hmm. And they might talk about money because money is important. They might talk about loss of companionship because that's important. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm looking at all the different grief reactions. So when someone comes in, I don't want to hear their story. A lot of times the grief story is very aligned with trauma and the, the loss could be a traumatic event that, so I, I I'm listening for cues around, is this tr trauma? How is the trauma related to the grief? How is the grief related to the trauma? If, if there was a sudden death, then they're in shock. And I call the first phase of grief, the emotional armor phase. And the emotional armor phase is that is that place where we all go to. I would say it is the only part of the phases that is consistently the first place you go to. You're in shock, you're numb, maybe you're a little, um, psychological terms like you're emotionally labile, meaning you're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're, you're really agitated. There's, there's, um, there's protest. No, this is not happening. I'm not going to do this. I don't believe it happened. And you've got all of that going on in that first phase. And that first phase is your protective phase. It's where you gather yourself. I love how you use this first phase and not like the step and that it's just this umbrella of, and it could look so different. It's not necessarily just anger that shows up as, you know, or denial or this, it's like a phase of a bunch of things and it could look so different for everyone. That emotional armor phase could look so different for everyone. Um, thank you for that. And thanks for clarifying the part of just, yeah, there's no, it's not, grief is not linear. Grief is not the same for everyone. So a client could show up the day after something happened or 20 years when that suitcase full of all the stuff they've stuffed and no longer can close suddenly pops open. So, um, so thank you for clarifying that. You mentioned 9-11. You, you lived in New York during that time. Would you dive into that component of the grief we were experiencing as a nation. You, ha you, you don't know, you, like, as, as I said, I don't prepare questions. So if any question I ask, you're like, forget about that. Let's not go there. Please tell me. Um, but the, the, the grief that we experienced as a nation, as well as, of course, you probably saw a lot of these people that were touched by it personally. So um, I, I don't know, how, how would you like to address that topic? Not unlike the pandemic that we have been living through, everyone deals with it differently. Everyone dealt with it differently then. The pulse in New York was fearsome mm. and brave. And when, when there are really specific roles that one can have either as a clinician or as a survivor, and I'm not talking about the families who lost family members because mm -hmm. that was devastating. And I'll, I'll go into that for a moment, but let, let me just pause on that because the aftermath of 9-11 of was one of we don't know if something is happening next mm -hmm. and we don't know if something is going to pop up or how afraid we need to be and it seemed that in those moments and months and even a year or two after that there was a sense of a collective unity that we had all experienced something that was undeniable and no matter what your race no matter what your gender, no matter what your religion, we all went through it and we all got hit in our ways and we all learned about ourselves. And for some people, the trauma of, of smoke and seeing what they saw made them flee the city and they would never return. For other people, they wanted to support the city and they couldn't get to the city fast enough. And that's how grief works. 
uh, you know, even though it's many, many, many years now on 9-11, uh, to take a pause, to take a breath, to understand the, the, the gravity of that, of those moments, uh, I think is really a, a, a lovely way to honor our own grief and our own sense of loss. Um, and to, to honor the men and women who were caught in the line of fire, metaphorically speaking, and cannot speak, but whose families speak for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully they've been given a role so that people don't forget. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for, for touching up on that and, and also bringing that parallel of the experience to some extent that the global uh, grief that we all went through um, during COVID. So let's touch on that, on these other types of grief that show up and that are not associated with death, because I believe that that is one thing. When I launched this podcast was exactly to talk about all types of grief, not just that with death. That's and right. how, because I think that there was this idea, I, at least I thought that grief only happened. We only grieved when somebody died. We that it was not in like it was not used in colloquial terms, <laughs> like you know, like oh yeah, I'm grieving because I got a bad haircut, like we were just talking before. So let's let's dive into that part of all these different ways in which uh, grief can show up. Grief hits all of us differently, depending on on where we are in our lives. Um, and depending on, on our, our life experience overall. So mm -hmm. for example, if I lose my house because I go bankrupt, because I got fired from a job that I really loved, but they couldn't really keep me on and I couldn't find another job and it all trickled down, the grief begins once you're fired and then and it can feel secondary and then as every little piece happens where you have a failed interview and then you're not feeling good about yourself and grief then manifests itself into i feel i have low self-esteem and i don't look good enough and you you're not finding your words grief happens in those moments as well as the loss of the role of caretaker. I'm care I'm taking care of my loved one. I'm taking care of my elderly parent. I'm taking care even of an animal. And I, I, it's not that I in any way want to belittle or take away from the intense, intense grief that one feels at the loss of a human loved one. But for many, their animals are maybe their only connection to love. And it must be spoken of because it's out there and it is all of a piece. And so, yes, I, 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 I can't imagine what it would be like to lose like our Ukrainian folks who are being hurt so badly right now and, and losing an entire family is of course different than losing a uh, an animal and yet one's grief is their own yes and to to say your grief isn't valid is um is an opinion and um often best kept to the self and if you can't find words then don't say any that's okay it's okay to say i have no words rather than saying, get over this. What's wrong with you? It's time. There's no timeline. It's nonlinear. There's no right or wrong. So I've mentioned a few areas where grief comes up that is not due to the loss of a loved one, the loss of a role, the loss of being, you know, an active parent when your children go off to school. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Empty nesting, when, empty, yes, nesters. empty nesting, when, when mm -hmm. losing of a limb, being sick. And believe it or not, 
when someone has been given a diagnosis that really says to them, you're not going to live very long. And then they end up surpassing the amount of time that they were given. Mm. Believe it or not, there is a survivor's grief and family members and loved ones and friends often don't know what to do with the given time, with the added time, because their lives may have directly shifted because of a timeline that was given. Oh, that and is. people Ooh, that... don't know what to do with this. No one does. It's borrowed time. And yet it's as if you're walking on eggshells. Again, it's not spoken of. And then there's a grief that is also not spoken of. And it's the, the relief that can sometimes come from a loss where the marriage or the partnership was hard, was brutal, was fraught with abuse, physical, emotional, sexual. And actually the surviving partner is released, but they can't share that. And they can't even talk about it. And it makes it so much harder for someone who finally feels free. Mm. My it touch, you touched on so many things and I have chills on so many because that part of the borrowed time does happen in some of these diagnoses. I know people, for example, with parents with, you know, things like MS or part, you know, what's the other ALS or any of these things that, you know, that are, you know, somewhat have a time and you think it's three times. And as you said, you kind of pause your, your life. Okay. I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to stay and be the caretaker. And all of a sudden that marks and then you're like, what do I do now? Right. So thank you for touching up on that. That is so important because it's not that you're not happy that you now have more time. Right. It's just that you don't know what to do now with That's that right. time. That's exactly Oh, right. that is valuable. The other one of the divorce, for example, or leaving that the relationship that happened to me. I remember seeing someone that had just recently divorced and I didn't know. And I'm like, well, where's your husband? It's like, oh no, we divorced. And my I went straight to the automatic pilot response, which I knew best not to, because it's I, I had a just experienced something similar. And I went to it was like, oh, I'm sorry. I went straight to the oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. And she was like, oh no, no, I'm happy. And I was like, oh, you know what? I take that back. I said, I should have asked you, and I went, I should have asked you, how do you feel about that first before me projecting my automatic response. So thank you so much for telling me that you're actually happy. So now I try to bite my tongue a second. And when someone says something, first ask, how do you feel about that? Before yeah. I share my condolences or yay, when's the party? <laughs> That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Yay, would you right. know any other phrases? What other phrases would you think that are like, if you do not know, aside from the, I really have no words to say, or how do you feel about that? Any other key like tools or phrases for someone going to a grieving person that may be helpful for the listeners? Lately, I've been hooked on this uh, Japanese Buddhist phrase or word called Shoshin, S-H-O-S-H-I-N, and translated it means a beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And I like it because if we could only approach people we love and people we know or don't know with a beginner's mind, with curiosity, instead of our own narrative, mm -hmm. it could actually change an entire perspective. Ah, and this is coming from the psychotherapist who wrote a book about grief and yet you can still go into it as that beginner's mind, not like, well, let me tell you everything that's going on with you right now. And right. You're just going straight into the, let me do this as the beginner's mind going straight to just the soul. So that is so valuable. That's a great tool. Thank you so much. Of course, you know, it's, we want to know the right thing to say. And sometimes there's no right thing to say. And to be okay with, there's no right thing to say is harder 
than maybe just like blurting something out because our brains want to have a narrative. Our brains want to make it all right. Our brains want to be the, the caretakers and the curators of I'm here. I'm here to help. Uh, I'm going to bring you food. But what if they don't want food? What if they're mm -hmm. getting so much food, they don't even know what to do with the food, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so again, it's like, let's look at that curiosity, that sense of curiosity around grief, the, the sense that there are so, I, I, I talk about this in, in, in my book, it's grief that there are 11 phases. I, and someone once said to me 11, God, that seems like a lot, <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's 11 for a lot of reasons. Number one, I think that 11 is a, it's a very special number. It's a sacred number and grief is sacred. The other, the other piece is that it, it, it allows you, it's kind of like it, even though it's nonlinear, grief is nonlinear. It, 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 it's like 11 months. It's like 11, 11 ways to meet your grief, 11 ways to dance with it, 11 ways, you know, to, to find forgiveness, to, to, you know, contemplate what anger is, how your anxiety plays with you, how anxiety and anger love to interact with one another, how when anger doesn't get expressed, guess what happens? Your, 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 your anxiety comes up and you express anger and the anxiety dissipates. Mm -hmm. So this is all part of the grief dance. And I, I just want to explain for a moment about the use of dance because it's about dancing, I think, is about partnership and how you're going to partner with whoever or, or even the music. And, and sometimes that partnership feels really smooth and easy. And sometimes it's staccato and sometimes it's jagged. And, but not being afraid to be in that partnership is part of what makes the grief process and your evolution in your own healing possible. So this is so important because right there, that partnership you, you mentioned in the, in the kind of the ideas or it was mentioned to me, the aspect of using grief as your ally. So this is that partnership you're talking about. Yeah. That ally. Absolutely. Okay. So in that, uh, in that dance and in this, this partnership that you're having with grief, how uh, do we then transform that and and make and help allow us or how, you know, of course, everybody back again, it's individual. What are ways in which we can use that grief? You know, for example, how I, I'm, I'm a performer, so theater. So when I'm nervous, transforming that nervousness into excitement when you all go on stage creates for a great performance. So there's this emotion of nervousness, but it's switched into excitement. So in grief and in this partnership, how do we transform that into something beautiful and what ways can it kind of show up in our lives? Grief will show up differently for everyone. And when you're ready, it can be one of your greatest allies. It can be a gift because you you take yourself on, you learn more about yourself through the process of grief than maybe in any other way. Mm -hmm. And actually I talk about this again in the book. It's like, are you an introvert, extrovert or ambivert? You know, it, because that's going to help you figure out how you, what kinds of aids you need to help you heal. You know, are you going to do it in a group? Are you going to do it like as an individual or are you going to find ways to maybe even do it on your own? or maybe just a little bit of everything. And so it's a process of getting to know the self. And that is one of the, the greatest gifts. Okay. The other piece is if you, if you, if you've lost a loved one, how do you take some of the lessons that they've taught you, even if the relationship wasn't great and you had, you fought against them, how does that fight and the energy of the fight actually get translated into how you're going to fight for your own life or how you're going to fight to be the best performer, or you're going to fight to have a voice, or you're going to fight to get the message out. 
that I love that, and I love how you express the different oh, the different types of people, right? Introvert, extrovert, and what is the other one? I had that for well, ambivert. It's ambivert, and it's oh. a combo of two. You know, and and we we all have a little bit of of everything, right? But the 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 uh, the introvert, the best way to describe the introvert is it's not that they don't like people, but the way that they regather energy is by being going in, mm -hmm. right? And the way that an extrovert gathers their energy is usually like with folks, with people. And the way the ambivert, it's kind of like a little bit of both. Sometimes, and I'm probably more of an ambivert, you know, sometimes I really need my alone time when I'm writing, when I'm processing, you know, my couch has a forever indentation in it. Because it's <laughs> like, that's where I am and I don't want to move, you know? And, and then when I'm social, I just, I want to go out there and I want to dance and swirl and, and not act my age and, 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 and while I'm doing that, there are times my mother, before she passed away, left me jewelry. And when I wear her jewelry, I feel like I am showing her the world. Mm -hmm. And, and so again, it's like, I'm using my grief. I'm appreciating the jewels that she had, and I get to show her the world through my eyes. I still, what a beautiful way of seeing that, that when you're wearing something from your mom, that it's a way of showing. Thank you for sharing that. The, um, the part of the tools within our personalities and really that discovering of ourselves. Um, thank you for that because we, we see, we tend to maybe recommend maybe the ways and tools that have helped us, but for someone else that may be completely like not the right way because that is not the type of personality they have. So listening to this and listening to if, if, if that person is grieving, that is grieving, cho chose in their tools to listen to a podcast, they would be listening to this, you know, that, and, and then gathering that there are so many different ways and tools that they can use for their grief is so important. Now, let's go into your um, book more, dive into your book. Tell us about the uh, the book again. The title is "It's Grief," and it has the dancing. Can you go into the the yeah, other so little part? I, if not, I have to change my screen here to look don't for worry it. About it, I actually I think I know it. So we'll okay, it. <laughs> <laughs> so one of us knows it. That's you know, good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's grief is the the main title. The secondary title is the um um. Well, oh, let me look for it then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the dance of self-discovery through trauma and loss. Thank you. So that is that is what you just even just describe of how we end up learning so much about ourselves through through the grief. Now, in this book, is it primarily then for someone that's been through trauma uh, of the death of a loved one or any type of grief? Who would be the right reader? And I have not read it. I didn't have time between the booking to to now. You know, so. it's it's really for for anyone who's experienced grief, I cover, I just talk about my case studies are about, you know, folks who have lost loved ones, folks who were not, were, were not sad necessarily about the loss of a parent who was cruel, uh, care, the loss of the role, the caretaker, the divorce, um, you know, different kinds of deaths, suicides, just, and it really takes you through, okay, so these are three different ways for you to assess kind of who you are. Mm -hmm. And I just talked about one, which is, you know, ambivert, extrovert, and introvert, but there are two other assessments and they really get you thinking about, well, gee, like, who am I? And how, how, how do I live in the world and how do I process? Once you get to know that, that in and of itself, grief has brought you to the book and you get to then explore. So that's one part. There's exercises throughout the book, stories throughout the book. I, I love, I love storytelling. I love narratives. And one of my favorite, favorite stories in the book is, is the opening. And I, I, I would just love to share it. It's, it's Please. quick. I, I do a lot of walking and I was, I was in Florida. I was, I was walking, I don't know, like in this big area. And there was a, 
area of water and there was this huge bird and and she was just kind of standing there and I stopped because she was so gorgeous and she stopped and she looked at me and she hopped toward me and I was like oh my god this is kind of cool and then I, I took a step toward her and then she took another hop toward me and then until we were like like really close and so she kept hopping on her one leg and it wasn't until I got really close to her that I realized that she only had one leg. Mm -hmm. And it made me think that, wow, here is this bird, this sand hill crane out in the wild, and she survived, she's thrived, she looked healthy. And yes, that like grief, she was missing a limb, she was missing something, and yet she figured out how to make it. What a beautiful visual because it's so true when we're in the middle of it, we do not see the other side, but there's sometimes evidence in our life where we really look back of other times in which we thought we couldn't survive that. And yet here we are. That's right. And, and that, that bird was that reminder. Uh, of how you. do I, we exist yes. without, without that limb? How do we exist without that loved one? How do we survive? How do yeah. we do more than survive? Right. And thrive. In this case, she was thriving, <laughs> you know, thriving even. Um, can, would you mind sharing a little bit when you were 27 and this, uh, and your love, uh, your first love died, were you already studying grief at that time or and psycho and, and psychology or psychotherapy at that time or not at all? Yes and no. Okay. What, I was always psychologically minded and Paul and I shared the love of, of Jung and Joseph Campbell. And we could just talk for hours uh, about, you know, the hero Shiro journey. And when, when, when Paul died and I reached out for help, no one seemed to be able to help this 27 year old girl woman really um, move through this. Um, try to figure out how to, how to, how to land somewhere. And I was so distraught. I wasn't thinking straight, obviously from the shoes. Uh, and I realized, you know what, I, I was actually going into the corporate structure. I was going to be a trainer and I was going to train about drug abuse in the workplace. And that was my thing. And I stopped everything. I then went back to school. I got a master's degree in drama therapy and sociology, and then another, another degree and in, in social work. And I put it all together to really form a relationship between grief and psychodrama and helping and, and, and the hero's journey and helping people find a way to creatively master how they're going to dance with grief. So we could say that this uh, dance of self-discovery of who you are right now might have not taken this path. You might just right now be training in the corporate world about drug, drug abuse in the workspace had you not had that experience at the age of 27. Correct. I would, yes, and, you know, the, the, what's interesting is that sometimes you can have one major loss and then what happens is it reminds you of other losses and other traumas. And that's what happened for me. The realization of having been bullied and having been a big, a, a larger person at, at one time and, and having been sexually abused, that all of these came trickling in or bombarding me to to really force me to say wow i have like chosen to box all of that up and now with paul's death everything has to be opened mm -hmm. and the realization that the grief was with me and walking with me kind of like the growth of bamboo that just grows right under its root system grows right under the surface and is so invasive and without even realizing how invasive all of that other stuff was, and it took Paul's death to wake me up. And that was just, you were, yeah, you were walking around with trauma that then his death then brought up. And I, I've realized that even just with myself, that when suddenly I have a certain loss that yes, all these other things kind of show up that you don't 
even realize were there. So yeah, and they're not invited. I want you, you all to know, okay? Yes. They, 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 they really are uninvited guests. Yes. <laughs> They're an invited guest, but do, do you think that they're showing up because it's like we need to address it so we don't keep on storing them in our body somehow? Yeah. So I have this great <laughs> magnet on my refrigerator and it's a pirate's chest and it's got a little button on it. And when you press the button, there's this like voice that comes out and first there's like this knock and then it says, let me out of here. And that's what was happening with everything. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's the thing is like, I feel like if we don't, then yes, it's like some way or another it's like gonna be in us in one way or another it, it's either gonna show up like you were talking before in anxiety or anger or in our own health so as an uninvited or as unprepared we are to receive these uninvited guests <laughs> they are showing up for a reason and we must address the <laughs> address the situation <laughs> But who would have thought that here we're talking about something that's so hard and we're yeah. able to find laughter yeah. and we're able to, to joke about the uninvited guest, you know, it's like the person who comes to dinner and doesn't leave, you know, <laughs> and all you want to do is like shove them out the door and it's like, oh no, I'm just going to hang out, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. You know, and they, they, they had, you go to bed, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you start sweeping around them and they're still, you know, like in a, in a, in a club, they start turning on the lights and That's like, it. you know, it's like, you're like doing That's everything. It. Oh, that is so funny. Now let's talk, you mentioned humor. Let's talk about that part of humor, like how that is a, sometimes one of the ways in which we even deal with this, something so heavy. Uh, how, how do you, what, what does Edie, <laughs> how does Edie use humor in her, in her journey? Or Dr. Nathan, I'm like, <laughs> it's, like oh, I no, it's, it's definitely Edie and I'm okay. not a doctor. Um, okay. But there's a, there's a little G there. Okay. So okay. it's right there. And, okay. uh, and, you know, the humor comes out depending on who I'm with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. And that's okay. And I love when it comes because it's spontaneous, never planned. Uh, the uninvited guest is, uh, is something that can certainly be related to uh, for er almost everyone, you know? And so it can be a chuckle time, mm. finding the, the places where there can be humor or a break, sometimes just just taking a breath break. Um, and, and I'll say to, you know, my, my peeps who are my clients, or if I'm, you know, speaking to a large crowd, you know, this is some pretty heavy shit. So yeah. right now we're just gonna, we're going to take a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also, when I was working in person and, and I, I will do this again, I, I would bring clay into the office and we would make a mask. We would make a grief mask. We would make, and we would change it and move it around and see, because clay is pliable and mm. clay is very much like grief. It can be pliable, but then when it's hard, it can be brittle. Mm. Ooh, that is a great analogy. A great one. That I had not. I'm going to write that one, clay as an analogy. Thank you so yeah. much. Now, in this last two years, have you noticed that a lot of people have reached out to you to talk more about this and the shift again in this dance of conversation around grief and the timeliness? Your book did, came out before all this, correct? Yeah. yeah, my book came out before this. And yes, yes, people are looking at themselves and have enough time now to sit with themselves, unlike any other time, you know, even during, you know, other times where there's been a, you know, a break in our work lives, you know, you're, 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 you're going on a vacation, you're planning, you're getting onto a flight, you're going, whatever. This, this was, oh my gosh, I got to look at myself. Am I happy? Or I don't even want to think about that question. The if you were single, if you were living in a 300 square foot apartment in New York City, if you were living in Harlem and 
food was even harder to get, or you weren't getting the money that you needed. You know, it, it, it affected everyone differently and it aroused anger and, and anxiety and certainly grief, mm -hmm. certainly grief, losses of so many, so many loved ones, burnout, burnout is very much related to grief and the burnout has been excessive just uh, which means medical mistakes and it means exhaustion and it means apathy and it means not feeling like you, you can even speak it means anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. so this time has tested everyone and for some folks it's pushed them to make different choices uh it's for other folks, it's made them realize that they didn't want to be married to the person they were married to. It made them realize that they didn't like themselves. Mm -hmm. It made them realize that they didn't want to be in the bodies they were in anymore, that they went on a diet or they started to exercise. So, and some folks gained weight and some folks started smoking cigarettes again and other folks started doing drugs and other folks got clean. And so this time was really a time of the, the gods temp tempting us to look at ourselves and, and, and saying, who are you going to be now? And that question comes up in so many aspects and, you know, uh, how do you call these forks in the road for us every time we have that choice of who? Who are we going to be now? Which path are we going to take? And, you know, this one was at a global scale that we all took different paths into choosing. Uh, but that crucial question will come up in any moment that we're faced with a transition. That's right. And it hit all of us. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter where you were living. It didn't matter. It, it affected all people all humans and that covers everything mm -hmm. period all mm -hmm. humans yes so you know, no one can say they weren't affected they might pretend that they weren't you know but you learned what you were made of for some you ignored for others and none of it's wrong and none of it's right I can tell you that the teenagers, the suicide rate, sadly, in many teenagers or the suicide ideation during this time um, was was pretty powerful. And their grief and their lost uh, uh, senses of development, uh, uh, their lost sense of a burgeoning sexuality or crushes or the first kiss or dating or marriages that got canceled the, these and and that's not certainly within the teenagers but mm -hmm. i would say the that younger the teenagers, population. yeah they really had a hard time and the parents had a hard time too if what the system their their systems were based on within their families what the system did not include having dinner together the system did not include homeschooling the system you know and who who did all of a sudden, maybe the family system had to reignite what had been lost or recognize what, what has been lost all along and choose not to still do anything. And what we also noticed, sadly, in, in seeing what was going on in some homes is that these kids were not getting their school lunches and so they weren't eating. And the, the difficulty of the parent or parents in the shame around that and the guilt and the um, sense of uh, hopelessness and powerlessness, which is all also part of grief, which we don't talk about. We don't. We don't. And it's so hard sometimes for people to ask for help in those kind of situations or sometimes there isn't any help you know in this and like when parents are not able to pay for their kids two meals at home you know they maybe have enough budget right. for one meal right. but not for two and those other two meals they get from the school system and right. um and these kids not being able to get that and 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 not knowing 
either by because of pride or because of not knowing even who do you reach out to for help and support when you're going through this is just and, hard. And often there's they, they didn't have internet connections and often right. they didn't have the computers at home to be able to even get certain information that, that, that they might have been able to get in terms mm -hmm. of where where are services, where can they get the help they need. And, and, and so now we're talking about grief in, in a whole different oh. realm, right? But a realm that cannot be dismissed, mm -hmm. a realm that needs our attention for sure. And, and you know, the, the desperation because perhaps some of these men and women who could not get, give their children what they need needed during this pandemic they weren't able to do the work that they were were great at doing, whether it was home care or 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 caring for the elderly or um, helping someone tend to their home. You know, they weren't able to 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 make those moves. They weren't able to necessarily travel on the subways or the because they, they were not essential. Even they were not essential that's workers. Exactly right. Or yeah, that's right. So 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 you know, this is a deeper dive into a grief that is. That is really so much part of the pandemic for sure. And then I, I want to just change the topic, if I Please. might, for just a moment, because I'm. It's your it's of, your interview. You take it wherever you no, want. You're the interviewer. No, 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 no. You're my <laughs> guest. I I've taken it many <laughs> tangents. Please go. <laughs> so, uh, the I'm writing a second book right now. <gasps> okay. And the working title is Sexual Grief. The human condition and sexual grief is a natural response to an unnatural experience it falls under a relationship to sexual trauma and trauma is not necessarily just abuse but the traumas that we experience over the time in our lives and it's also grief but it's a different perhaps a different kind of grief mm. and we don't talk about it. It hasn't really, this idea, this type of grief has really not been discussed. And I'm, I'm very excited about it because it seems that it's often, sexual grief is often misdiagnosed as anxiety or depression. And I'm sure that, 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 that they are at play. However, if, you in your in your life have a, a a bad experience as you enter menopause or or you know you came out of a very religious home and you can't live as the person you know you are because of that very religious home the sexual grief that happens affects every part of you I, I was just going to actually even ask you that if that if the grief in sexual in the sexual grief could come up because of the thoughts or beliefs you had growing up about sex and then how that translates then into now your experience that then wait a minute I'm not supposed to feel pleasure this whatever if it's not outside of this that's right. Kind of little box, right? So then there's grief associated with that and and that grief has a whole bunch of different layers of guilt of right all yes, these other guilt, aspects shame, shame. Right. yeah yeah so that's so important so glad that you're doing that because it if if people then kind of uncover that they can heal that aspect of of themselves as well Absolutely. so let's go into how people can find you Edie and also you said that you might go back into doing it in person or you have the two books again it's grief by Edie Nathan and you can find it on Amazon or Go on or, you know, any, any, really any Bookstore. of the bookstores um, have it. And if they don't have it, you can also order it. Uh, and if any of your listeners uh, come to my website and, you know, enter your email and tell me that you heard me on this show, I will send you a gift of a chapter uh, from the book, The 11 Phases of Grief, and I'm happy to do so. And, uh, and if you choose to purchase the book, Every review I get helps someone else discover this book. And that is that is so important because it may even 
be that, yes, maybe you're kind of interested, but the fact that someone, this might save them, <laughs> this might save them. It's so important because it's like we're opening that conversation for someone out there that needs to hear that. So thank you for that. And the other book then, will if they subscribe to your website, then they'll and be they'll able to know. And then they can pre-order. And right now the working title, and so let me just tell you, the working, working titles don't mean that that's what it's going to be. But right now the working title is Sexual Grief, The Human Condition. Okay. And uh, I would imagine that within the next six or seven months, I'll, I'll be more clear on when they can start to pre-order. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Now, Edie, was there something I did not ask that you would like to share or any other tips that you'd like to share with the audience before we close off? I have a particular way I love to end. Please. And it has to do with the character of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. And Dorothy was given these red pair of shoes bestowed upon her. And then she met, you know, the lion and the tin man and the scarecrow. And they were all aspects of parts of her that she had to heal with. She had to understand she had a brain and she had a heart and she had courage so she could go on her path. And then she met the wizard who really was not as powerful. And your grief is is like meeting all of these different parts of you and is like the wizard that is not as powerful and you've got the power in the shoes. Beautiful. Thank you so much again, Edie Nathan, with us today and grateful for your time and for your wisdom and for this analogy that several analogies that I will take on my <laughs> put in my toolbox as well. So once again, thank you. And for the listeners again, edynathan.com yep, or her website. Thank, thank you, you, Kendra. Thank you. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.